welcome everyone uh, to the Health for the World International Grand Rounds here. Um, I'm Ankur Barija, a founding faculty here at Health for the World, and it's my privilege to uh, invite and introduce um, our guest faculty speaker today, uh, uh, Dr. John P. Irvin, who is, as you can see, uh, an esteemed uh, faculty uh, a Coon Chair uh, in the Department of uh, Medicine at North Shore University Health System, um, also a clinical professor of medicine, University of Chicago, uh, Pritzer uh, School of Medicine. Uh, formerly, he was a senior um, staff cardiologist and a professor uh, and chair in the Department of Medicine at Baylor Scott and White Health, Texas A&M College of Medicine. Um, Dr. Irvin has uh, been in various leadership positions uh, nationally and uh, uh, very active on Twitter as well, uh, very well renowned in the space as an educator, as a leader. Um, so we are uh, fortunate to have him as a guest speaker with us uh, today. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Edwin, and thanks again for your time. Uh, we will uh, let you uh, take it away from here. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, as, as mentioned, I just recently moved up to te uh, from Texas uh, to Chicago, and so uh, this is going to be my first uh, winter up here, uh, although I did spend some time in training in the upper Midwest where it gets cold, but uh, a little, little different for me at this point. Uh, but it's, a, it's wonderful to be able to reach out and uh, speak to people from across the world that I esteem greatly. Uh, this is an area, uh, infective endocarditis, that is near and dear to my heart, and hopefully one that uh, you will not have to face too often in your career, but un unfortunately you will, and especially if we don't think about it enough, uh, we'll make mistakes with that. So I think it's very important sometimes to go back to the basics, to really uh, uh, what we would call batter's practice uh, in baseball. Uh, in that it's, it's important to get back to the exact fundamentals of how we assess and manage this, uh, this diagnosis. So my objectives today is that, we, that you're able to discuss the changing patient factors and microbiology of infective endocarditis as it has evolved over the last decade or so. Also to help you to outline the steps to diagnose infective endocarditis and then lastly, to apply those uh, diagnostic uh, abilities to being able to treat patients who are affected by this. I don't have any disclosures, any financial disclosures, although I am on the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, Valvular Heart Disease uh, Guideline Writing Committee. Uh, do note that next month we will have an update in these guidelines. And so uh, please stay tuned because there's a lot of really interesting things that are happening in, in vascular disease and in uh, valvular disease uh, coming out in these new guidelines that will be published in December uh, across the world. So look forward to that. I wanna start off, we're, we're clinicians and this, that's where everything should start. I wanna start off with a case. And uh, this case is a 67-year-old uh, female that presented to us with fever and shortness of breath. She had a history of mitral valve prolapse and uh, also had a recent infection of her hand that had spread up her wrist. She had sweats and chills for about three days. And on examination, she was a bit tachycardic. Respiratory rate was a bit high. Blood pressure was 100 over 60. And temperature in Fahrenheit was 101.4, so a little bit of a, a low-grade uh, fever. Uh, again, on examination, she was tachycardic. She did have a normal uh, first and second heart sound. There was a 3 over 6 holosystolic murmur at the apex with pre-diastolic uh, accentuation of that murmur. And the remainder of the cardiovascular exam was normal. Lungs are aroused a third of the way up bilaterally, and there was also 11 centimeters of jugular venous uh, pressure distension. The exam otherwise was completely unremarkable. Uh, in terms of data that we gathered on this patient, uh, her blood cultures were in ne initially negative. She had been recently treated for a wrist infection with Keflex, cephalexin. Uh, her chest X-ray showed an enlarged cardiac silhouette with cephalization and bilateral alveolar infiltrates. Her BNP was elevated to 1,000. Hemoglobin was a bit low. White blood cell count was a bit elevated with a left shift. 
The EKG showed uh, sinus tachycardia, but was otherwise normal. There was a transthoracic echo done that showed severe mitral regurgitation with a likely perforated P2 posterior leaflet segment. But the ejection fraction was actually hyperdynamic at 70%. So I'm going to have you just think about this for now, but maybe uh, any of those who, who are available to click into chat, why don't we do a little pretest and see how you would answer it at this point. So in this particular patient, what's the next best step? A, should we give six weeks of antibiotics intravenously? B, should we refer her to urgent surgery for a mitral valve? C, should we do a transesophageal echo to look for vegetations? Or D, should we give three weeks of antibiotics and then surgery if blood cultures remain negative? I'm going to just take a peek here and see if anybody's putting anything in. Again, this is sort of to base and to hang everything that we're going to talk about uh, for the rest of the talk uh, for you. And everyone will be able to answer this correctly by the end, but anybody who wants to take a chance, go ahead and and, and put in what you think uh, at this point, too. But let's move on as people are doing that. Endocarditis obviously is not a new diagnosis. We've uh, had it described in our medical literature for many, many years. Uh, many of Osler's Goldstonian lectures uh, provided the first comprehensive overview of this disease. And then Lewis and Grant were really the first to link transient bacteremia with these deformed valves and put that together as a syndrome. But again, the introduction of penicillin in the early 1900s really marked the first point that endocarditis was not uniformly a lethal infection. Although I think as we will move forward, you will understand that it still has a very high lethality despite our improvements over the years. So let's look at the classic view of endocarditis. The classic view really has been that of subacute bacterial endocarditis. And uh, we, we know the Duke major and minor criteria. I've shown it to you in this cartoon now. We look for two major criteria or one major, three minor, or five minors. And I'm, I'm gonna walk through that in a, in a table to come forward. But I just wanted to show you the classic view in that this is the way that it is initially described in the textbooks. And in many parts of the world, this is the way that it is still seen. But uh, in many parts of the world, this is becoming a very increasingly rare presentation for how we see endocarditis. Again, the, the modified Duke criteria are diagnostic criteria, and they're fairly well circumscribed in terms of how we determine this. We're looking for the typical microorganisms. Uh, also, we're looking for microorganisms that we know uh, are consistent with infective endocarditis in persistent cultures. Uh, and even a single blood culture for Coxiella or phase uh, one IgG antibodies uh, for Coxiella would be something that would be considered to be a major clinical criteria. Or a positive echocardiography or new valvular regurgitation in the proper setting. And then the minor criteria are going to be those of predisposing cardiac conditions and intravenous drug use, although you'll see as we move forward that may not be as necessary these days. Temperature that's elevated, again, uh, using Celsius for most of the world, Fahrenheit for those of us uh, in the United States. Uh, vascular phenomenon, such as those things that I mentioned on the previous uh, page, as well as mycotic aneurysms uh, and, and some other manifestations, as well as immuno, uh, immunologic phenomenon, such as glomerulonephritis and some of the other manifestations that I'll show you some pictures of as we go forward. We also use as a minor criteria positive blood cultures for those who don't meet the major criteria or serologic evidence of active infection with an organism consistent with infective endocarditis. So keep that in mind. This is an easily uh, attainable reference. Uh, the modified Duke criteria has been our gold standard for many, many years now. There are also pathological criteria that we use, uh, including microorganisms that are demonstrated by culture or histiologic examination of a vegetation or pathological lesions, a vegetation or intracardiac abscess confirmed by histologic exam showing active endocarditis. Obviously, that's not how we want to diagnose. We would rather confirm it that way if need be, but uh, the, the clinical uh, criteria are going to be those that are going to be more, most important to, to us, especially those of us in internal medicine. So moving forward, I'm going to show you a few pictures. Does anybody know what the first uh, uh, module uh, indicates. What does that show? 
anybody either put it in on chat or let's see here if anybody, everybody's quiet today. So uh, those of you living near where I am probably need more coffee. Those living in, in Cameroon probably have had a long day already. So it's making it a little tough, but uh, that, that uh, first image is that of a splinter hemorrhage. The, the second image is that of what? An Osler's node. And then the last one being a Janeway lesion on the palm of the, of the hand. So uh, does anyone know which, uh, which one of these lesions tends to be painful? I'm going to give a couple moments on chat. Everybody's shy today. So just remember, I'm a simple caveman cardiologist. So if I can remember, anybody can remember it. But the Osler's node is the one that is typically painful. And just think about Osler's, oh, it hurts, okay? That's a good way to, to keep it in mind. Uh, I frequently find when I'm rounding that people get them mixed up, but I think that's a very simple way to remember. I just wanted to show you a couple of other examples uh, in, in different uh, skin tones and in different manifestations in, in other people. Uh, again, these are classic findings of endocarditis, but increasingly, especially in the West, we are not seeing quite so much of these subacute findings that, that occur. The Janeway lesions, recall, are actually septic emboli, and surprisingly, that, that it's not as painful. There may be a little pain involved with it, but it's not nearly as painful as the Osler's nodes, which is an immunologic manifestation, and those tend to be quite painful. Again, just a few more examples and then adding in also the raw spots that we can see on an ophthalmologic exam. Clubbing is fairly rare with endocarditis when it's isolated. It can happen in, in absence of cyanotic heart disease, but many times when we see that, it's when there's an underlying uh, uh, congenital abnormality uh, that is associated with it. But it, it has been, there have been case reports of people developing clubbing from endocarditis uh, without having antecedent hypoxic uh, uh, disease. So what's changing? Well, the, the bacteria that we're seeing is changing to some degree. And I'll show you some slides as we move along. But uh, classically, uh, we were looking at Viridin strep as being the main culprit uh, and, and looking at cases of uh, uh, strep, group A strep. Uh, type infections were the vast leaders in the past, but we've seen a shift and I'm going to, I'm going to spend time talking to you about that as we move forward. We're seeing older and older patients develop this as the immune system tends to drop off uh, with age. Uh, we, we are seeing a lot more of our older patients that plus uh, being combined with uh, not necessarily the older people injecting, but injectable drugs and intravenous access. Uh, so it's, it's almost unheard of that a patient would be in a hospital without an IV access of some sort these days, whether it's a peripheral IV or a central venous catheter. These are very common and they very commonly are going to be the source route for how a person would then go on to develop endocarditis. And then lastly, but certainly not leastly, those uh, uh, drug resistant bugs that we're dealing with these days. Especially in the West, we have been poor stewards of our antibiotics over the years. We've had a lot of people on antibiotics when they didn't need them, and that's led to a lot of emerging resistance of, uh, of bacteria uh, to, to our typical agents that we have used, both for treatment and for the prophylaxis of, of some of these uh, infections. So let's move to the evolving epidem epidemiology beyond those patient factors and beyond some of those other societal factors that have occurred. Another thing that's been an interesting phenomenon over the years, and again, I want to point out that this is very population de dependent. Depending upon where you live in the world, there still may be quite a great deal of rheumatic heart disease. But more commonly in, in uh, most nations, we're seeing that uh, there's less and less rheumatic underlying heart disease and more and more issues with mitral valve prolapse, older senile degenerative changes of the valve that have led to uh, a nidus for an infective endocarditis case, but even more worrisome and more common 
are those patients who actually have normal valves and develop infective endocarditis. And that will become apparently clear as to why that's happening as we move forward, in addition to what we've already discussed amongst the, the various factors that are coming into play with iatrogenesis and the aging population. But if you look at this study from 2012, this was actually published in the European Heart Journal, looking at patients who had uh, infective endocarditis. And this first uh, uh, panel is for those that, had, that presented with septic shock with the second column being those without septic shock. But you can see as you walk down the line here uh, what the relative ratios are of our typical strep and intercoccus and things of that nature uh, that used to rule the roost, as well as our hasic organisms that used to rule the roost in days of old. Uh, whereas nowadays, more than 50% of what we're seeing, especially in a patient that's presenting with sepsis, is going to be a staph uh, species of some sort that's causing the endocarditis. And, and again, more commonly, especially if there's septic shock. And then those that are presenting without septic shock, it's still a very large percentage if you take it in aggregate as to the number of patients who have staph as their underlying cause. And then we also see this negative culture endocarditis down at the bottom. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to opine upon that just a little bit more as we move forward in the slides. If you think about some of the culture negative endocarditis that we're dealing with these days, uh, these really haven't changed much over time. Uh, still have uh, Bartonella, still have Brucella, still have Coxiella, Fungi, Legionella species, Mycoplasma species. Uh, again, staph and strep, when, when we see these coming out as uh, culture negative, many times these are patients who have been treated with antibiotics before they had blood cultures done. And that's actually a class three indication, meaning it, it, it's, ba it's bad for the patient. It actually causes harm for the patient if we start the antibiotic before we get the culture drawn. And so I just point that out uh, as, a, as a source for uh, a clinical concern that we have in terms of culture negative endocarditis. If we start to look at the overarching diagnostic approach, however, to infective endocarditis, uh, things have changed a little bit in terms of the diagnosis approach over the years, and, and there have been some fine tuning and some nuance that have developed uh, from the standpoint of us uh, learning how to, to diagnose this better. And so I'm just going to walk you through this algorithm very quickly as, as we uh, uh, start off our approach to how, to how to look into these patients better. Um, so first, if we're starting with a patient that's either at risk or that has suspected, this is non-native uh, valvular endocarditis or prosthetic valvular endocarditis. So those patients who have had previous valve replacement, whether it's uh, 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 a prosthetic valve of a mechanical sort or even a tissue valve, and then, and then again, native valve endocarditis uh, being the first. So clearly, again, we take the blood cultures first. That's a key to the rest of the tree for us in terms of walking through the modified Duke criteria. We also feel strongly that there is a need for a heart valve team, and that, that can be very comprehensive and it can be very simple. At the very least, it requires an infective endocarditis physician, or pardon me, an infectious disease physician, a cardiologist, and probably a cardiothoracic surgeon. But depending on the case, it may also require uh, pharmacy, may require anesthesia, may require neurology, may require radiology, and especially neuroimaging in that we do see a fair amount of uh, neurologic uh, issues that develop in these patients with endocarditis. But then our first step in our pathway these days is going to be the transthoracic echo. And so if that transthoracic echo tells us what we need, we can pretty much ice the cake and start running down through the, the remainder of this algorithm. If, however, that transthoracic echo is non-diagnostic, or if there's a, a suspicion of a complication suspected, uh, most of the time that's going to be something along the lines of a, of a leaflet that, is, uh, that has become disrupted or potentially even an abscess. And so if we see heart block, for instance, develop, in a patient that we did not see an abscess on the transthoracic echo, that would be a good reason for us to proceed down the pathway to get a transesophageal echo. Uh, 
The other places where we would move quickly towards getting a transesophageal echo would be infective endocarditis with a change in the signs or the symptoms, or if the patient is at high risk of complications. And many times that's going to be a patient that already has a mechanical valve in place or that has had recent manipulation to the valve. Again, those with staph, enterococcus, or fungal infections, we have a lower threshold to going to trans pardon me, transesophageal echo, namely because those are very difficult to treat with antibiotics alone, and many times it will progress despite our antibiotics uh, or antifungal medications. Or if a patient has got stable endocarditis but is being considered for a change to oral antibiotics, and we'll talk briefly about the POET trial that uh, was recently published about two years ago that talked to us about uh, potentially being able to move away from intravenous antibiotics a little faster. Again, those that are undergoing surgery, if, if there's something found in the first part of this workup that requires surgery, we do recommend intraoperative transesophageal uh, echocardiography in everyone. I'll point out that the color coding in this slide, if it's green, that means it's a class one indication. That means we have good data to support what we do for that. Randomized studies uh, are multiple large uh, population uh, studies that would tell us what to do. If it is yellow or orange, that's a class two indication, meaning that it's either reasonable or should be considered to do these things, uh, but that the level of evidence isn't quite as strong as what it is in these other ones. If we do have a T trans thoracic echo that shows staph without a known source, uh, we would still probably have a very low threshold to move to a TEE, transesophageal echo, to look further. Also, if it's inadequate or we sus suspect uh, paravalvular abscess, even in the setting potentially of a TEE, maybe there's a prosthetic valve that's in place that makes it a little difficult. Sometimes cardiac CT or even FDG PET can help us in certain criteria. If patient has a possible uh, infective endocarditis by the modified Duke criteria, the FDG PET study can be very helpful in either moving the patient into a category of not endocarditis or definite endocarditis. So it can rule out people more so than it can rule in. We have to be a little careful about that study in patients who have had a recent valve surgery and that there's inflammation that will light up on an FG, uh, FDG PET. And then again, if we have nosocomial staph aureus bacteremia with a known portal, uh, we're gonna think highly about doing a TEE because again, staph is very prone to develop, developing abscesses that we may miss on a trans thoracic study in and of itself. Now this one gets even a little bit more complicated, but we're gonna spend some time to step through this too. This is actually our, our treatment uh, algorithm. And so we have a patient that has defined infective endocarditis. Again, pointing out the key that if there's valvular heart disease with suspected or unexplained fever, please don't give antibiotics before we've done the blood culture because it can be very difficult to manage and to know what the prognostic uh, uh, situation is if we don't have the blood cultures first. Those patients that have staph or strep in their bloodstream or enterococcus in their bloodstream that have been predated with antibiotics before the culture, and it has a negative uh, culture initially, sometimes that can lead us to think that the patient is going to do better than they may otherwise. And so again, just key. Remember that red was not on the previous slide, but red means class three, meaning there's either no evidence for treating it that way, or there's harm in treating people that way. But as we walk down the, the steps, and nobody's going to make this mistake, but as we walk down the steps, we treat with antibiotics along with an infectious disease consultation. And then if the patient, this is another key, uh, especially uh, in uh, the United States over the last few years, we have seen a dramatic rise in intravenous drug use. And there, there is data that would indicate now but if we get that patient referral to rehabilitation and or opioid substitution therapy, that we can actually decrease the likelihood of them having a recurrent endocarditis. So this is something for you to, to be mindful of because uh, drug abuse is present throughout our globe. Uh, and, and it's something that we must be mindful of in terms of how we manage these patients because it's going to be a little different. If there is a stable left-sided infective endocarditis after antibiotics, 
uh, then, then we can change to oral antibiotics after we've done a TEE. Now, this is on the basis of the POET trial. And what they did in this trial is they randomized patients to either continue with six weeks of, of an intravenous antibiotic course versus around day seven to day 10, they had a repeat TEE. And if that TEE showed that the valve uh, lesion and or the, the cardiac situation was stable, they switched those patients to an oral therapy at that point, about day seven to day 10. And what the outcome of that POET trial was is that there was, a, there, there was no uh, harm in making that switch in treating this way. So again, these patients had TEE to diagnose, and then they had a TEE done seven to 10 days after they had started therapy with intravenous medicines. If they were stable, at that point and deemed to be potential candidates for oral therapy, they were then randomized into continuing with IV therapy or going down the oral pathway. The oral pathway did just as fine. But again, the other part to that study is they had weekly follow-ups in the clinic with each of those patients. And that is very hard to reproduce in the real world. It is very difficult to reproduce having that done. So keep that in mind. I would urge you to go and read the POET trial, P-O-E-T trial, just to make sure that if you are going to utilize the data that came from that study, that you know that your patient fits into that study. If the antibiotic has been started with the ID consultation and there's a cerebral embolism or stroke, then we do want to discontinue anticoagulation. If, if the patient does not, then we may temporarily discontinue the vitamin K anticoagulation just because it hangs around for a long time. And about 50% of our patients that have infective endocarditis that is not viridin, strep, are going to go on to need to require a heart surgery of some sort, as you'll see as we follow the pathway down further. So if we make the decision about surgical intervention, this again is made in a team fashion, utilizing our infectious disease doctors, cardiology, uh, and, and then also surgery plus minus cardiac anesthesia. As we do that, and the patient has recurrent uh, emboli or persistent vegetations despite antibiotic therapy, we want to think about early surgery. And what early surgery means is it, it within the index hospitalization. So within the first 30 days of the hospitalization is when we tend to consider that. Um, a large vegetation being greater than 10 millimeters that's mobile uh, again, we think about early surgery. Now, remember these levels of evidence that I'm showing you here. These are yellow and orange, so these don't have the same level of evidence as, as these indications that I've mentioned before or will mention over here. But I want to just bring your attention back to that fact. And then, in addition, um, if there's a relapsing infection after completion of antibiotics, that patient should have surgery. If there's a major ischemic stroke or intracranial hemorrhage, we should try to delay that surgery greater than four weeks. We know that that's sort of a magical cutoff in terms of when the risk and benefit may outweigh themselves. So we, we, if, if the major stroke, if there's a major neurologic deficit or a large area of bleed within the brain, we want to wait at least six weeks to consider surgery for those patients. In those patients that have infective endocarditis and have an implanted cardiac electronic device, we need to get complete removal of the leads and the generator. This can be a difficult thing for a patient, especially with a defibrillator or that's pacer dependent, but uh, it is very necessary. We cannot treat these patients successfully when, when they're leaving their entire pacer system in there. And then also recurring, recurring endocarditis and poor source control. Again, we need to think about the intravenous drug users again, and we need to also think about those patients that uh, you know, if, if someone has an abscess elsewhere that we know is going to continue to seed, then we have to put the team together and decide what is a proper approach. In many cases, these may be a palliative or hospice type approach for these patients. One other thing that I want to point out as it pertains to these patients that I talked about in the POET trial, in the POET trial, they were only looking at streptococcus, enterococcus, staphylococcus, or coagulase negative staph deemed stable by the heart valve team. Those are the only uh, pathogens that were looked at in this study. And again, 
looked at very closely by a heart valve team working together. The thing that we also have to remember as it pertains to infective endocarditis is the differential diagnosis. And the most common that we would talk about in the differential diagnosis would be probably a Marantic or a Libman Sachs type endocarditis. Atrial myxoma is there as well. Left atrial thrombus usually can be determined as a, as a separate uh, process, but sometimes not, especially if there is uh, rheumatic heart disease, it can be uh, uh, sometimes difficult to make that decision. You also, in acute rheumatic fever with carditis, can see thickening of the valve leaflets that can certainly mimic uh, infective, acute uh, infective endocarditis, where it's really more of an immunologic effect in that acute infection. And then also uh, neoplasms. Uh, we certainly do see neoplasms that uh, affect the uh, valvular structures and the perivalvular structures. And clearly that needs to be contained within the differential diagnosis when we look at these patients. Let's take some of what we've learned now and uh, apply it to some patients. So this is a patient of mine. Uh, she, she is a 62 year old uh, with uh, weakness and sweats. She has a history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a high gradient, but with normal functional status prior to the onset of the most recent symptoms. Three weeks prior uh, to coming to see me, she had had uh, teeth cleaning done and she did use subacute bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis, even though that wasn't necessarily in the guidelines for her at this point. Uh, she uh, then started developing some fevers, weakness, and sweats, and she went and saw her primary care physician after this occurred and was, was complaining of a little nasal congestion too. So the, the doctor said, well, let's, let's give some Bactrim for sinusitis. And the patient was no better after a week, so the primary care physician switched the, the patient to Cipro. Uh, then uh, the patient was clearly not getting better, feeling even weaker, and she gave me a call and she said, something is just not right. Uh, uh, here's what's happened to me. Can I come see you? And so we brought her in and clearly I was very concerned about infective endocarditis because hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be a, a congenital, uh, an inherited uh, disorder that uh, certainly can predispose people to infective endocarditis. So we got blood cultures, which were neg initially negative. Now remember she had been on two antibiotics already before. Her sed rate was very increased, however, and her cultures eventually did grow out strep uh, gallolyticus. And uh, anybody know what strep gallolyticus used to be called for the older folks of us in the, in the chat today? Strep bovis. And with strep bovis, we have to think about some other things. Remember strep bovis, strep gallolyticus, we need to think about a colon cancer in this patient. So. Uh, always be, be mindful of that when you see strep gallolyticus, when you see strep bovis, it will generally be reported as strep gallolyticus these days. When you see that, think about colon cancer as well. Uh, so we did an echo and the echo did show a seven millimeter vegetation on the anterior mitral valve leaflet. The gradient across the left ventricular outflow tract with her hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was unchanged and the degree of mitral regurgitation that she had had before was also unchanged. So uh, in, in this patient, um, we, pardon me, I'm gonna get back to the question. The next best step in this patient is A, immediate referral to CT surgery, B, six weeks of IV antibiotics, C, transesophageal echo, D, FDG PET CT scan. What else we should we do now? I see a few more people are on the chat now. Does anybody? Some, some people want a TE. And again, I would say that's not altogether wrong, but I'm gonna go with the proper answer here being six weeks of IV antibiotics therapy. So a uh, patient uh, has a, a, an organism, which is strep, uh, strep gallolyticus, which is actually usually fairly amenable to treatment with anti IV antibiotics. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, she is not showing any signs on her echocardiogram of worsening valvular uh, issues. And she is not really having clinical signs of significant uh, congestive heart failure either. So in this situation, 
I would recommend six weeks of IV antibiotics. The places where I would do a TEE is if, if her echo was not a good one and or I was seeing heart block and or if it was a different agent, I might consider a, a TEE in that case. Uh, probably not an FTG PET in this situation. And then again, an immediate referral to CT, I wouldn't, or to CT surgery, I would not do that at this point uh, because of lack of those other things that we had mentioned in that algorithm as reasons to go urgently to surgery. Now, I do want to make one comment as it pertains to what's changed in terms of infective endocarditis. We have gotten a lot more strict on what we use in terms of uh, reasons to undergo an, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. And what we've seen over the years since that's occurred is, is there really has not been an increased rate of those typical organisms that would cause endocarditis in the past by not using this. As a matter of fact, the NICE guidelines has, have become fairly nihilistic and they're not really giving antibiotics uh, in the UK and, uh, and related to the NICE guidelines in anyone. So prophylaxis is, is gone down on the list in terms of things that we do. Those places where it is good is when there's pr uh, prosthetic material within the heart, patients had a previous history of endocarditis, has unrepaired cyanotic heart disease, or has a cardiac transplant that has a regurgitant valvular lesion there. Uh, again, we usually do that only for periapical uh, gingival tissue manipulation. We don't recommend in, in any of these cases uh, doing, uh, doing prophylaxis for TEE, EGD, colonoscopy, or, or cystoscopy in the absence of an active infection in that area that's being manipulated. So keep that in mind. One of the things that you need to know is that even eating crunchy foods actually causes uh, transient bacteremia. Even brushing our teeth every day causes transient bacteremia. And so that's one of the reasons why the guideline committees went back and looked, were we doing the right thing by prophylaxing so many people? Because obviously we're not gonna give prophylaxis every time someone eats a meal or before every time somebody brushes their teeth or flosses their teeth. So uh, again, keep in, keep in touch with these newest updates to the recommendations for prophylaxis. Uh, definitely antibiotics do not come uh, benignly. They can cause harm themselves. So let's move to another patient. This is a 25-year-old male with fever and lethargy, uh, an IV drug user, off and on for seven years, a history of tricuspid valve endocarditis one year ago, comes to us with seven days of fever, weakness, and shortness of breath. Other than appearing toxic and elevated temperature, exam was unremarkable, aside from being a two over six hole stock murmur along the rest, left, right sternal border that increased with respiration. So we're thinking again, tricuspid regurgitation. The chest X-ray is unremarkable. The echo shows a 10 millimeter vegetation on the tricuspid valve with moderate tricuspid regurgitation. The blood cultures are positive for staph epidermidis. So in this patient, in addition to initiating culture-driven IV antibiotic coverage, what else is recommended at this time? So I'm going to have you guys chat again. A, tricuspid valve replacement. B, TEE. C, referral for opioid substitution therapy. D, lecture the patient regarding his poor lifestyle habits. So let's see what you guys would do. I think that's the answer still for the previous one. There's Okay, we got some people that want to think about replacing the tricuspid valve. Well, let's go ahead and discuss this a little bit. So the correct answer here is referral for opioid substitution therapy. Uh, not, good, good thoughts with replacing the tricuspid valve because if you, if you looked at that algorithm and it talked about moving to surgery, there is a 10 millimeter uh, uh, vegetation, uh, although there's no heart failure and there's no def definitive mechanical complication of the valve that is leading to severe TR and severe right-sided right heart failure. Uh, so the thing that you need to know about most of those, that algorithm is it's related to left-sided endocarditis. In our drug abusers, especially those with tricuspid and pulmonic valve uh, disease, we have even been able to show in years past that people can actually tolerate pretty well even just having that valve removed if it's a recalcitrant infection. Uh, 
So we're not nearly as quick to move to a surgical intervention for right-sided endocarditis, especially in a drug abuser, because they're very much more likely to have recurrent uh, infections if they continue, especially to inject. But the reason that we're going to use opioid substitution therapy is we want to help this, this poor person get away from the drugs. That's what's causing this. We, we probably will be able to treat this uh, staph epi with antibiotics uh, and get them cured from it. Uh, but again, the key for this person is they're very likely to have recurrent infective endocarditis as time goes along if they continue injecting drugs. And it's going to be very important that we try to interrupt that cycle. So again, thinking about the indications for early uh, heart valve surgery, heart failure. Just think about heart failure. If it's caused by a valvular issue for any reason, uh, heart failure is something just keep in mind. We're going to send that patient for early surgery. If it's an uncontrolled infection, if the antibiotics aren't working, as we say in, in medicine, the failure of medicine is surgery, right? So uh, if, if our medicines aren't able to take care of that infection, then debriding that infectious uh, tissue within the heart is going to be the key issue for us. If there's a paravalvular complication such as an abscess, that does not pass go. That goes straight to surgery. We certainly cannot heal that one uh, with antibiotics. That is going to require a surgical intervention to be able to get that taken care of. And then again, prevention of systemic em embolization. Uh, certainly the place that we worry about the most is, is uh, cerebral embol embolization, but uh, we can certainly have uh, infarcts across the entire uh, circulation uh, related to systemic embolization. So remember those patients that have large vegetations here described as greater than 10 millimeters or accompanied by greater than one embolic events while the patient is receiving appropriate antibiotic therapy. That's somebody that we would think about an early surgery for. So let's go back to our initial case to wrap things up here. Um, this, again, 67-year-old underlying mitral valve prolapse, recent infection of the hand, comes to us with fever and chills, tachycardic, a little tachypneic, blood pressure marginal, elevated temperature, Examination shows a three over six hole stolic murmur at the apex with pre-diastolic accentuation, and the remainder of the CV exam is normal. I want to point out to you that pre-diastolic accentuation does not always mean mitral stenosis. If you're in an area where there's a lot of endemic uh, rheumatic heart disease, you may hear rheumatic stenosis, uh, mitral stenosis a lot. But remember, in severe mitral regurgitation, because of all that volume in the left atrium, there is a pre-diastolic accentuation of that murmur also heard there. And so uh, again, the lungs, they're aroused third of the way up bilaterally with elevated jugular venous pressure, uh, and the exam was otherwise unremarkable. Again, going back over this patient's data, uh, we have uh, an initial negative blood cultures, chest x-ray showing heart failure, BNP showing heart failure, a little anemic, a uh, little leukocytosis is has left shifted, uh, no heart block on the EKG, she's tachycardic, but the TEE, pardon me, the transthoracic echo does show severe MR with a likely perforated P2, uh, the, the uh, second segment of the posterior mitral leaflet. EF is normal. So knowing what you know now, how should we answer this? What should we do for this patient? Six weeks of antibiotics, urgent surgery, TEE or three weeks of antibiotics and then surgery if the, if the blood cultures remain negative. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat here. Okay, so there's still a little bit of a question. This algorithm will be back up there for you to, to review, but I'm going to go ahead and, and give the answer that the guidelines would say is correct and what I, I think is correct for this patient. So again, if we think about this patient a little bit more, they've got an underlying valve pathology and mitral valve prolapse. They've got severe MR that's led to heart failure. And really you can stop right there. It doesn't matter what the size of the vegetation is, anything else. With that being said, however, 
The patient also had a perforation in the mitral valve that was also causing some of the leakage that was occurring there. And so that's a structural reason to consider going ahead and going for urgent surgery for that mitral valve. And so urgent surgery, what that means by definition is taking the patient to the operating room without a full course of antibiotics. And, and in general, if there's heart failure, there is really no reason to wait. There really is not. Treating, sort of marinating the patient in antibiotics even for a few weeks. There's been another recent trial that just came out less than six weeks ago that would indicate that those patients did not do any better by getting a little short course of antibiotics before surgery. Their recurrence rate of, of, uh, of endocarditis was not lower than those patients that went for urgent surgery to have that valve replaced. And also, uh, there, there was uh, a lower mortality rate in those patients that had the early surgery. So keep that in mind. Heart failure associated with severe uh, mitral perturbation or valvular perturbation means surgery. It means let's do it urgently. So as we think about the, how we summarize what we've talked about today, Anytime we have a valvular lesion, think about infective endocarditis, but also think about it when there is no underlying valvular lesion, especially as staph has continued to be an evolving organism as to what we're seeing in endocarditis. One may have a completely normal substrate to their valve and develop staph endocarditis. It is not uncommon, so keep that in mind. And again, remember that roughly 50% of our patients with non beard ends endocarditis will eventually need surgery. So we need to keep that in mind with their blood thinning. We also need to keep that in mind with having a surgeon on board. We also need to keep that in mind about who the rest of the team is. That multidisciplinary heart valve team is going to be essential in guiding us properly through this course. And I said, be very careful about POET, going back to that POET study that I want you all to go read after this. Make sure that if you're going to take that approach of an early switch to an oral antibiotic, that your patient fits the criteria that they can have the follow-up that was necessary in that POET trial and that you can continue to follow them in the clinic weekly. And then lastly, but not certainly not leastly, leastly for those right-sided endocarditis patients, please, let's get the therapy necessary for them to make sure that they have the rehab or the substitution therapy that they need to keep them away from injectable drug use uh, because it, it's become a very severe problem across our globe at this point. And that is all for the formal that I have for you. For those of you sitting in the back of the room that may not be able to read this, this is a coronavirus and it says this one is dedicated to all the people who did not believe in me when I was getting started. So as a, as a parting shot before I answer some questions, I want to have I want to thank you all for what you've done in this, this fight that we've had. Uh, I know that no one has gone untouched by this. I know that our entire world has been changed by this. I thank you for the, the servant leadership that you have given through the course of this. And I thank you most importantly for the care that you give to our patients. So I'll open it up for questions now. I see one question. See, I think we have uh, quite a few questions. I'll open up the uh, Q&A box here. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Dr. Urban. Great uh, slides and thanks for making it engaging. Uh, I find it hard to do that with Zoom these days, but uh, I'm glad <laughs> we're able to get in some questions as well. Um, that's great. Um, wonderful. And, and a great message to end all, uh, I agree. Uh, sort of uh, brought all of us uh, uh, together uh, in the world with, with uh, sort of no one is spared uh, right now and everyone's affected. Mike, should we uh, give our uh, Cameroon classroom uh, the opportunity first perhaps to um, share and then we can maybe go to the, uh, the Q and A chat. Yeah, let's do that. And I think they're unmuted, so they can ask any questions when they're available. Um, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, we've had a patient here who suspected um, endocarditis because the patient had a vegetation, but the cultures were negative. And we started the patient on, I think, vancomycin, cetriazone, and gentamicin. 
But the problem here is vancomycin is very expensive. And so usually the patients want to go home on something oral. So uh, what's your take on what can we actually give as an oral medication for somebody who has a negative culture? But it's actually it's has vegetations and had um, a septic embolism. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. Again, just to kind of go back to our culture negative endocarditis, it is, it is a real thorn in our side, whether the patient has the capabilities, whether our systems have the capabilities or not, it is a difficult problem to manage. And so uh, again, I would, I would look very closely for what you think the source may be and, and certainly try to cover empirically for those. If you can keep that follow up, I think uh, you know, in an ideal situation on the basis of what we have data for, you, you need to have that trans uh, soft geal echo to do the follow up, but obviously there's there are constraints in many parts of our of our world in terms of how able we are to do that, and then constraints also in terms of being able to go with prolonged in, intravenous antibiotics. I certainly run into that problem occasionally in Chicago as well, and so in that situation we do our very best to discuss with the patient that. This is the evidence that we know. This is how we know that you're going to have your best outcome if we can treat you this way. But if, if, if reality gets in the way and there are situations that we cannot deal with in that regard, then I would go with, with the most potent bactericidal antibiotics that we can use orally. And I would recommend that that patient have as frequent a follow-up as possible so that someone can listen to the heart uh, you know, these days with uh, things like the Alive Core and things like that, we can look for heart block and other possible complications. And so that may be our, our second tier. Again, I don't have great evidence for that. We, we like to work in the, in the evidence realm, but we also realize that reality doesn't always fit our evidence. And so we do the best we can. We be good doctors. We treat we would probably repeat the cultures at some point down the line after the patient has been on some oral antibiotics for a bit to see if we have at least gotten rid of the, uh, the bacteria in the bloodstream at that point. So excellent question, difficult problem. Uh, I, I get cold sweats when I have to deal with it too. Thank you, Any, anything else uh, from Cameroon? There's a question related to uh, guidelines that take into consideration patients with comorbidities such as chronic kidney disease, diabetes, or pregnant patients. It's, a, it's another excellent question. These are obviously going to be people that are immunocompromised. We don't have separate guidelines as it pertains to infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Uh, I will tell you, though, that our chronic dialysis patients, especially uh, whether that be peritoneal or fistula uh, dialysis, um, those patients are at a higher risk, definitely, for endocarditis. And so what I would say in all of these patients, just keep your, your threshold for suspicion much lower. Think about it, do the cultures, uh, and, and, and just keep it high in your differential. I think we probably keep going on the questions in the Q&A then. Uh... Yeah, uh, we have a question from Abdul Hamid. Uh, how do you differentiate between calcification and vegetation in older patients? Great question. Now, I'm going to repeat it just to make sure I heard it properly. It broke up just a little bit. What's the difference between a calcification and a vegetation in older patients? So uh, it can be a very difficult problem. In many of our older patients, we're starting to now see what we see called degenerative valvular disease where they'll actually develop calcium deposits on the, on the valve leaflets themselves. Again, especially high prominence in those people that have chronic kidney disease. We see that more commonly. But um, calcium is not going to be associated with an acute vegetation. When you see calcium on the valve, it could be degenerative change that's occurred over a number of years based on hemodynamic issues, based on metabolic issues that may be going on, but it also could be a healed vegetation from an, from an old infective endocarditis. So there is some overlap, but in most people, 
we're, we're able to fairly clearly tell what's an active vegetation versus what is a calcification, be it from de degenerative process or potentially an old healed vegetation. Great question though. There's a follow-up question to that by the same individual. Uh, can a cardiac CT or MRI help to diagnose the presence of vegetation? Cardiac CT, cardiac MRI is gonna usually have a hard time making the diagnosis of a vegetation, especially one that if it's not seen on TEE or trans thoracic echo, it's gonna be unlikely that you would see it on a, on a CT or an MRI. The CT and MRI tend to have a lot more benefit in those patients that were looking for perivalvular issues. So uh, annular root abscess, an abscess uh, uh, adjacent to the valve. Potentially though, we can, we can see uh, the, the presence of stenosis. For instance, in a, uh, a prosthetic, a bioprosthetic valve, uh, we, can, we can see that on the CT or an MR. But in terms of delineating between a vegetation uh, more so than an echo, usually the CT or the MRI is not going to be as sensitive. In some of those larger vegetation, certainly we can see them on a CT or MRI. And if we gate it just properly, I have certainly seen them that way. But I would tell you that our transthoracic and transesophageal echo would be one and two uh, from the standpoint of, of being better than CT MR. And the MR be used predominantly to look for those perivalvular issues. Okay. And I think one just came into the chat. Um, Dr. Irwin, if you can still see the chat, this one did not show up in the QA. Let's see. Um, yeah, are there guidelines that uh, take into consideration patients with comorbidities such as chronic kidney disease? Oh, I think we already answered that one, didn't we? I, I think I missed the one just before that, however. It says, so in a failing heart in the setting of invective endocarditis, does right. that mean surgery ASAP? Yes, that's what it means. So uh, endocarditis, heart failure, surgery. Do not pass go. Uh, it should be a surgery. The only place that that's not the case is if, if a person has such significant comorbidities that they're not expected to survive in any way and or you know, obviously shared decision-making with the patient, the family, and the heart valve team. Uh, frequently, because we're dealing with people with a lot of comorbidities, maybe it's in-stage renal disease and an elderly patient that also has bad infective endocarditis and heart failure, many times that really does come to a discussion as to the goals of care. Uh, would this patient really want to go to a surgery that has a you know, a 50% mortality rate associated with it to start with or, or even higher in some cases. Uh, is that something that they would really want to do? Or is this a situation where we need to think about uh, comfort care and, and hospice and palliative care? Because truly infective endocarditis uh, that has an indication for a surgery but is too high risk for surgery is almost 100% fatal still. That's what hasn't changed over the years. Uh, even dating back to the pre-antibiotic era, we, we kind of fall back in that group of patients that has an indication for a surgery, but for whatever reason cannot undergo it, the, the mortality rate in that situation is, is as close to 100% as you can get. Okay. Let's see, another question in the chat uh, way up there it says, um, as a cardiologist, how would you address the nature of the bug itself? Strep, Novia, Galo, refer to GE or auto uh, colonoscopy or FOBT? Ah, great question. I didn't follow that up, so I'm glad somebody asked it. So we were talking about strep gadoliticus and strep uh, uh, bovis. Again, same agent, just new name in the gadoliticus. And so in those patients, I always do a screening colonoscopy uh, to, to assess them. Um, it, it is important enough because the prevalence rate of, of an endoluminal issue is high enough that I would go ahead and get a colonoscopy. In, this, in my particular case, in my patient, we did. She did not have that. She had uh, some diverticuli 
did not have active diverticulitis, but uh, um, her colonoscopy was negative for, for uh, uh, polyps and or cancer. So thank, thank you for closing that loop. I brought it up and didn't, didn't give you the clinical answer that we had. See so, you another know, question just in the chat says, is it for is it for both acute and subacute infective endocarditis heart failure and the indications for surgery? Yes, yes. So I would say either either one, if they meet those criteria, uh, whether it be acute or subacute, uh, it, it should be considered. There would really be nothing uh, to gain in the subacute endocarditis. Um, the one difference in the subacute endocarditis is that uh, most of the time, most of the time, we can treat those medically, and they generally don't present with heart failure and or sepsis and or uh, uh, abscesses. So they, they tend to fall in a little different category in terms of whether they have those corresponding indications for surgery. But if they do, if they have a valvular lesion that is caused by that endocarditis, and it's leading to heart failure and or it's got an abscess and or it's got any of those other things that we mentioned in the algorithm, yes, they still need surgery for that. Okay. We have two more questions I see here. Uh, when you suspect central line catheter infection related endocarditis and if there's positive blood cultures and there's thrombosis on the catheter tip, uh, did you recommend catheter removal immediately or after a course of anticoagulation to dissolve thrombosis on catheter tip? It's a great question because we've all seen complications that way, right? Um, I, I recommend getting it out ASAP. Uh, you, you really can't do anything as long as you've got that infected line in there. There have been some case studies, case series looking at that, whether or not you actually increase your risk of uh, of, of sending a thrombus downstream uh, uh, by just pulling the, the catheter. And uh, it is actually very rare that it's gonna cause a clinically significant one. So I, I try to get it out just as quickly as possible. I will say that there have been some occasions just on the basis of, of us having some of the technology with our snares that uh, I've used our interventional cardiologist and our interventional radiologist to actually snare the thrombus on the end of the, uh, of the catheter uh, and pull it all out at once. Uh, but that's been a handful of times. Um, and so uh, what I would say in, in general is that there have been case series that show that your likelihood of having complications are higher if you leave that catheter in place than if you just go ahead and remove it, whether there's something on the tip of it or not. It's a great question. It's one of those things that makes me sweat when I see it. Okay. Uh, one more question here I see. Um, how do you differentiate between thrombosis on the central line tip and endocarditis? It, it comes down to clinical. It really does. If a patient's having a fever, however, and or if they've got blood cultures that are positive, I'm going to consider that it is either a vegetation or it's an infected thrombus. So I'm gonna manage it the same way with that. Uh, in the absence of an infection, in the absence of positive blood cultures, then, you know, again, I think clinically, empirically, I'm gonna consider it to be more likely a thrombus at that point. But fever, white blood cell count, uh, certainly with positive cultures, uh, either, either that's a vegetation or it's an infected clot, one of the two. Okay. Thank you for answering those. Um, Encore, do you see any more questions here in the chat that we haven't answered? Uh, uh, no, box, think, we've gone through all of them. I think that's good in the interest of time, then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. I know we're like a minute above the hour. Um, I, I again would uh, wanna thank you, Dr. Irwin, for your time today. Um, this, this, it's, it's a great uh, opportunity to have someone like you, uh, with a live audience, uh, especially our collaborators in Cameroon, India, Bhutan, I see. Uh, as well had joined. Are you able to uh, see the screen, Mike, from our Health for the World website? Yes, I can. Oh, I just wanted to uh, 
uh, share a plugin for our uh, fundraiser. As, as we all know, Health for the World is a, a 501c3, uh, you know, expanding global health access for the education and uh, uh, other tools. Um, specifically for COVID this year, we've done uh, PPE donations uh, locally here in the US uh, and uh, abroad as well to our partnering sites. And of course, we've uh, had ongoing education, which has been uh, key for some of the, our collaborating sites in medicine and radiology, apart from uh, COVID specific uh, webinars um, as the new information was coming. And also we've had projects for seniors uh, in, uh, I, I, who have been socially isolated in senior livings and assisted livings and hospices with a Letters for Hope initiative. So I would encourage everyone to check out our website, healthfortheworld.org, uh, and see what we're doing in terms of COVID and otherwise. All these lectures, as you all know, are available on YouTube, um, accessible free of cost. And uh, right this week, we have launched our fundraiser um, uh, committing uh, to raise more funds so we can get more PPE uh, to areas in need and continue doing our educational activities. Uh, so I would encourage uh, you to share this with, with your peers and others um, so that um, you can uh, sort of uh, be part of this work in, uh, uh, in many ways and uh, keep, keep all of this moving forward. Wonderful efforts. Thank you for having me. And again, everyone be safe. I, I think uh, all of you who have listened in and uh, uh, if you want to join me on Twitter, I can answer questions from here to eternity. And certainly if you'll tweet out that link uh, for your fundraiser, I'll, I'll tweet that out as well. Okay. All right. Thanks for your support, Joan. And thanks for your time. Enjoyed being here with you all. Have a good day. Be safe. Be safe. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you. I'll see you later. Bye, everyone.